I'd like to welcome all of you who are attending uh, for the first time this morning, but especially to welcome all of you back who were here yesterday, uh, where we had a fabulous set of panels on things ranging from student engagement uh, to the world's energy problems uh, to how to develop uh, the world uh, in an environmentally friendly way. Uh, this morning we have, uh, we'll have two more panels uh, continuing our theme of the Grand Challenges. Uh, the first uh, this morning will be a panel on um, uh, resistance to uh, vaccines uh, and then an afternoon panel on environmental justice. Uh, to kick off this morning's session, I'd like to turn it over to Christina Graff, who's the Associate Director for the Center of Health and Wellbeing and a recent uh, MPA grad. Morning. I want to welcome you all here on behalf of the Center for Health and Wellbeing, where we have a couple new exciting initiatives going on. One is we are very pleased to be overseeing the Health Grand Challenges projects, which some of you heard about yesterday. I think today's panel discussion is a great example of where different disciplines can come together to address a complex health issue related to infectious disease. We also have some breaking news here in that this past week, we just got formal approval to introduce a new undergraduate certificate program in global health and health policy for the university, open to students from all departments. So we are thrilled about that new program. And uh, I'm judging from your reaction that other people will be happy about this too. So. We're, we're pleased about it. For more information, you can talk to me about it after, or you can also look at our center's website. But for this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce this panel discussion on global health and infectious disease, in which we'll be examining issues related to antibiotic resistance. Today, we have four distinguished speakers who've played diverse roles in addressing this complex problem through different avenues. And I'll begin by introducing our moderator, Dr. Anthony So. Dr. So is currently the director of the Program on Global Health and Technology Access at Duke University Stanford Institute of Public Policy. The program supports research, policy meetings, and teaching on issues of global health, particularly related to the ownership and control of knowledge and how it's harnessed to improve the health of the poor. The program is also the strategic policy unit for REACT, an international coalition for action on antibiotic resistance. Previously, Dr. So served as Associate Director of the Rockefeller Foundation's Health Equity Program, where his grant making focused on access to medicines in developing countries, charting a fairer course for intellectual property rights and enabling developing countries to respond to the challenge of tobacco use. Prior to joining the foundation, Dr. So directed the activities of the Liaison Office for Quality as Senior Advisor to the Administrator at the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He supported Secretary Donna Shalala when she co-chaired a presidential advisory commission focused on improving the quality of health care for all Americans. And he contributed background papers in the development of a Consumer Bill of Rights. In a six-year combined program at the University of Michigan, he received his BA in Philosophy and Biomedical Sciences and his MD. He earned his MPA from the Woodrow Wilson School and Dr. So completed his residency in internal medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and his fellowship at the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program at the University of California, San Francisco, and Stanford. Dr. So has served on several nonprofit boards and in various advisory capacities, including as a member of the Woodrow Wilson School's Advisory Council. We're so pleased to have him moderate this panel. Thank you so much, and thank you, um, Dean McCarty, and also uh, Christina, so much for your generous introduction. And I appreciate also thank you so much for the Center for Health and Wellbeing for sponsoring this session. It's wonderful to return to the Woodrow Wilson School after so many years. I'm so glad she didn't mention what year I graduated in, but I'm honored to be able to moderate and help kick off this morning's um, panel on antibiotic resistance when drugs don't kill the bugs by offering a few remarks to place this global challenge in a policy framework. Now, in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech in 1945, Alexander Fleming stated, 
But if I would like to sound one note of warning, penicillin is to all intents and purposes non-poisonous. So there's no need to worry about giving an overdose and poisoning the patient. There may be a danger, though, in underdosing. It is not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin in the laboratory by exposing them to concentrations not sufficient to kill them, and the same thing has occasionally happened in the body. Over the coming decades, his words would prove prophetic. Now, we've come to know, actually, antibiotic resistance by many names. It's an issue that grabs an occasional head, front page headline is when Andrew Speaker, suspected of carrying drug resistant tuberculosis, boarded a passenger plane to Italy and back, or when a school child succumbs to methicillin resistant staph aureus or MRSA. But in fact, of course, antibiotic resistance claims its victims under the flag of a dozen diseases or more. JAMA reports, of course, in 2005 that MRSA killed more of the people in 2005 than HIV in the United States. And perhaps, though less well reported in our press, it is a global problem as well. Last year, a Tanzanian study found that mortality rate for gram negative infections in hospitalized children actually was double that of malaria. A significant risk factor for death in those cases was the inappropriate treatment due to antimicrobial resistance. And in fact, you can see actually these sort of headlines playing out actually over our intermittently, but don't receive the sort of actually attention that, say, the Global Fund places on uh, AIDS, malaria, and TB. But certainly antibacterial infections have been, of course, the source of much of the problem that we're dealing with in antibiotic resistance. And antibiotic resistance is also a problem of globalization, as this map retracing the worldwide spread of penicillin resistant. Streptococcus pneumoniae clone 23F illustrates, the bug that actually caused pneumonia and a number of other infections as well. <coughs> Our first panelist, Stuart Levy, will discuss the scientific and clinical underpinnings of how the selective pressure of antibiotic use leads inexorably to resistance, and how antibiotic resistance has spilled over from hospitals to communities. I hope you'll also will share some of his work over the past quarter century at the helm of the Alliance for Putting Use of Antibiotics, one of the groups that certainly sounded the early clarion call to this problem. Now, preserving the effectiveness of antibiotics poses a classic public goods problem. Put in context as a problem of individual versus collective action, we find that there are trade-offs, as when, for example, a physician, in the face of clinical uncertainty, opts for empiric or presumptive therapy, reaching for and prescribing, as we all would as a physician, an antibiotic just in case a patient needs therapy, appropriately not taking the risk, actually, that might come with waiting for that diagnostic test to come back from the lab, and, and just go and end up taking the risk of delaying treatment. Often, actually, the clinician will also prescribe a broader spectrum antibiotic or a combination of antibiotics so as not to miss a resistant strain. And this leads, of course, to a vicious cycle at the level of the individual clinician, but with consequences with the availability of effective antibiotic therapy at the level of the community. And there are similar tensions that play out also among the individual and collective behaviors of other stakeholders as well. For example, the drug company. To recoup its R&D costs and profits, might prefer to market aggressively an antibiotic with broader indication and use, and therefore secure a larger market. Even if it's more rapid uptake, it might accelerate the development of resistance and diminish the antibiotic's eventual use. Failing to do so, a, co a competitor's antibiotic in the same therapeutic family might bring cross-resistance in any case to its patented product. Or the insurance company would sooner perhaps pay for the hospitalization of a patient, a hospitalization extended by, antibiotic, by resistant infection, than to pay for infection control at the local hospital, lest there be free riding by other insurers who do not do their part to contributing to infection control at that local hospital. So one set of policy questions is what public sector interventions might help realign individual and collective actions by these stakeholders to combat antibiotic resistance. On today's panel, we will be looking at cons both conserving the effectiveness of antibiotics that we have today, as well as through demand side interventions, as well as replenishing the supply of antibacterials for tomorrow's future. Looking at the supply side, our second panelist, Maria Ferrer, who till recently served as the CEO of the Global Alliance for TB development, Drug Development, will discuss the role public-private partnership can play in priming the pipeline with new antibacterial drugs. We find that in the 1930s and the 1940s, several new classes of antibiotics were developed. 
In the 1950s and 1960s, more classes would follow. But few new antibacterial classes have surfaced in recent decades. In fact, there's been a significant hiatus between the 1960s and now almost over three decades in discovery of antibacterials with a novel mechanism of action with only a couple of new bright lights, essentially, during the 2000 period. And over the past decade, there has been a significant exodus of major research-intensive pharmaceutical firms from antibiotic discovery and development. After all, antibiotics are used typically for short course therapies that cure disease and thus eliminate their continued need for treatment in a given patient. In contrast to say, the chronic disease treatment actually that might actually place a patient on a drug treatment for life. The large number of antimicrobials also already approved results in a high level of competition for newly discovered agents, newly developed agents. The appropriate public health need to limit use of broad spectrum antibiotics, thereby minimizing the pressure that drive resistance causes the medical community to discourage the first-line use of newly developed antimicrobials, and that may neg negatively impact sales. For all these reasons, it's not surprising to see a shift in drug R&D towards other therapeutic categories, such as treatments for chronic diseases. The net present value, which you see on the screen, is just a means by which companies can determine the value of a given project to, product to develop, to develop a new drug by weighing, on the one hand, the expenses of research and development, and against, on the other, the projected revenues into the future. The higher the net present value, the greater the revenue margin on the drug product. These figures provided by Steve Perjan of Wyeth Iherst, you can see in descending order how much more profitable a drug in the musculoskeletal drug category is, say, compared to vaccines or injectable antibiotics. The relatively lower profit margins for R&D on antibiotics and also vaccines makes it more challenging for countries to prepare for the challenges of infectious disease threats and of replenishing the supply of antibiotics. And just framing just the technology policy options, realize, of course, there are many non-technology policy options as well to tackle this problem. We may seek to increase, seek to rather decrease the need for antibacterial use. So in some cases, we may be pushing for vaccine development or deployment. We might also seek to improve the rational use of antibacterials to delay the emergence and spread of resistance. And this might call for more strategic use of diagnostics. And, but even with these complementary technologies, though, we will likely need to accelerate the development of new antibacterials. And as we look at the um, R&D pipeline, one can map a range of public sector interventions and like other sort of range, the, like the range of push incentives to pay for R&D inputs, public-private partnerships, in effect, can reduce the level of private sector investment involved, diminish R&D risk, and thus eliminate, perhaps rather stimulate, rather, R&D. Now, on the demand side, the typical actually thinking has been to reduce the risk of a resource-limited market by guaranteeing greater returns. This can be through advanced purchase commitments or other pool approaches that pay for outputs of R&D. And for antibiotics, though, rational use may mean using the drug for more targeted indications, not a broader indication that delivers a larger market. So therein lies another policy tension. How to provide sufficient incentive for R&D for new antibiotics, yet maintain the affordability of these new drugs in developing countries. However, our third speaker, David Walinga, will demonstrate how the Keep Antibiotics Working Coalition has worked to change the market dynamics along the supply chain and thereby reduce the inappropriate use of antibiotics in agriculture and our food supply. Now, we'll focus on this panel on antibiotic resistance, the resistance put up by bacteria um, to these drugs. Of course, many of the same concerns over resistance also apply to the treatments against the AIDS virus and the parasite malaria. But it is important to understand the interplay and ties between resistance for drugs to AIDS and malaria and resistance to antibiotics. For sometimes a drug in the same therapeutic class actually can be, it may be used, and the resistance for the treatment actually of one disease diminishes the effectiveness of the treatment for the other. For example, as illustrated on this slide in Malawi, children treated with malaria with sulfadoxine, paramethamine, were later found to have a higher incidence of essentially trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole resistant strep pneumonia, which is the disease again associated with pneumonia. Both are sulfur drugs. One is for malaria, one is actually for strep pneumonia, but the cross resistance still is an issue. 
Similarly, equally importantly, as, policy make, as policymakers, we must also look for the synergy in combating antibiotic resistance through improving rational use of drugs in the delivery system. And finally, before turning to our first panelists, a final framing note to the students in the room. There is much opportunity to make a difference in this field. Last summer, we had the good fortune of working through the Duke Global Health Fellows Program with a Princeton graduate, Adam Castano, who's now a University of Michigan medical student. We arranged for him to spend his summer in Geneva at the World Alliance for Patient Safety, and also to visit with the REACT Secretariat, REACT being a new global coalition or network actually working with the People's Health Movement, Health Action International, and others on issues of antibiotic resistance in Uppsala, Sweden. Out of his summer's work, he prepared a paper showing the intersection between antibiotic resistance and patient safety. He had an opportunity to present it to the WHO Assistant Director General, David Heyman, who many of you will know was the one who played an instrumental role in stopping the SARS epidemic. And we have early indications that the third campaign for actually the World Alliance for Patient Safety will actually, after hand surgery, hand hygiene rather, safe surgery, will in fact be antibiotic resistance. A really exceptional fellow, Adam actually has returned to his medical school, has authored an op-ed piece on issues of antibiotic resistance, and started a student chapter of a new organization called, and inspiringly, Antibiotic Defense. I hope that today's presentations will help also inspire some of you to join Princeton alums like Adam and others to work on this important challenge. And with those um, remarks, I want to also introduce now um, Stuart Levy, our first speaker. Stu Levy is the Professor of Molecular Biology and Microbiology and Medicine. He's also Director of the Center of Adaptation Genetics and Drug Resistance at Tufts University. Um, most of us know him actually, of course, as the present and, of course, the inspirational force behind the Alliance for the Prudent Use of Antibiotics, which for many years has actually been, in fact, the leading organization actually in, breaking, in bringing awareness to policymakers about this issue. He's co-founder and chief scientific officer of Paratech Pharmaceuticals and past president of the American Society for Microbiology. His scientific work has also deserved significant note as well, has included the discovery of the first energy-dependent antibiotic efflux mechanism and efflux protein, and he, of course, has published, as many of you might also know, the classic book, The Antibiotic Paradox, How Miracle Drugs Are Destroying the Miracle. And perhaps most importantly here, he's also the proud father of two Princeton undergraduate students, um, Suzanne and Arthur. <laughs> Welcome, um, Stuart. Thank you so much for kicking us off with this panel. Thank you, Tony, very much, and uh, I want to thank you all for coming. I'm particularly pleased that my children are here with their friends. Uh, it may be an early hour for the students. Um, I, uh, there are a lot of names that we give to the problem, but the one thing is for sure, as Dr. So said, it is international. And it may be a specter of multi-drug resistance because it doesn't limit itself to just bacteria, but parasites and viruses, as was uh, mentioned. I think that um, the Alliance for Prudent Use of Antibiotics put out a document in 2005. It was a global advisory on antibiotic resistance. And when we looked at the issue, we realized that it was a shadow. It was really a black cloud on the ability to treat common diseases. And whereas in the United States, we usually have backup drugs, that isn't true uh, as our neighbors in the Western other parts of the world. In fact, uh, for any of these diseases, uh, there are strains which are resistant to not just one, but to multiple different drugs. So that, in fact, the current problem is not what Alexander Fleming warned, which is resistant to penicillin is resistant to penicillin and tetracycline and chloramphenicol and cephalosporins, all in one organism. So the other point is that what Fleming might not have realized uh, is that this issue would not just limit itself to where antibiotics are used most in the hospital, but actually outstretched into the community. Now, I'm reminded of the story of Willie Sutton, who was asked, you know, why do you rob banks? And I'm sure you all know the answer, which is because that's where the money is. So when we asked, where is resistance, we all said, look in the hospital. And of course, that's where it was, because that's where the antibiotics are. Well, that's not true anymore. Antibiotics are spread all over the community and all over the United States in many different ways. When the anthrax scare came up, uh, and everybody was rushing for the miracle drug to take care of it. 
Some of you may remember it was ciprofloxacin. And uh, the story is how did it become ciprofloxacin? Well, apparently someone called uh, the FDA and they asked, what is the drug for anthrax? And they looked down the list, it was alphabetically, uh, direct, and certainly there was Cipro and Doxy and Penicillin, but the first drug was the one mentioned, so it was Ciprofloxacin. So here is a drug that we use for really serious illnesses that was suddenly going to be the uh, drug to save anyone with anthrax. Who was going to get it? How would they know? And ABC News did a, a query at the time, and would you believe that 2% of American households had somehow gotten Cipro and had it in their medicine chests? some of whom got it on the web. Glamour Magazine asked a young journalist to call, go to the web and say that she had a urinary tract infection and wanted some Cipro. So they, the MD on the web said, fine, um, we'll give you a seven-day supply. And then they requested, do you want a refill? And she <laughs> said, yes, and she said, yes. And at the end of the short interview with the web, she had gotten a 60-day supply of Cipro, which was, by chance, the uh, recommended dosage for an anthrax attack. <clears throat> so you can get them, and it costs you $256. I remember it well, and an interesting story in Glamour Magazine. Anyway, I want to just show you <clears throat> this list here in the hospital. Uh, we separate organisms into how their cell wall takes up a stain. Interestingly enough, invented by hands Christian uh, Graham, who in the late 1800s developed the stain, which we still do use today. There aren't too many simple techniques that are done, and we can do it in the emergency room right there on slides. Well, anyway, the Graham negatives don't take up the stain, and Graham positives do. That's one easy thing you can see, and that separates out the kinds of antibiotics you might or might not be able to use. But there's a long list here, and I want to point out an important one, which is MRSA, which originally stood for methicillin resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA. It's now clearly multidrug resistant because these organisms are resistant to 8 to 12 different antibiotics, and in some cases they're untreatable, and in some cases are people are dying. MRSA is the poster bug for antibiotic resistance. We haven't found a child, we don't want to, but we have a bug. Because when you talk to people, they all know, is it MRSA? And what MRSA's real problem is, you can't treat it easily because it's multi-drug resistant. And some of the drugs we do use, like vancomycin, which is a life-saving drug, there are still strains which are coming up with resistant to vancomycin. On the community side, we have E. coli for urinary tract infections and a gonorrhea for sexually transmitted diseases and other diarrheal organs. And then, of course, we have Mycobacterium tuberculosis, you'll hear from Dr. Frail later, on TB and resistance, and it is a real problem. In fact, it's invented the other term, which is ex extremely resistant TB. I don't know how more resistant you can be than our friend Emmer, uh, MRSA. How do we become and how do we create resistance? We need two things particularly. <clears throat> we need the antibiotic, which kills off everything susceptible and allows those that are resistant to stay, and with them coming together, <clears throat> you have a resistance problem. Now, when a clinical microbiologist calls me and said, we just discovered this organism with seven different resistances, I'll say, well, where else is in the hospital? Well, it's only in this one ward, so we can sweep up there and try to keep that contained. It doesn't become a clinical problem until I, as a clinician, or Dr. So, or Wallinger, or any of us, see a patient that does not respond. But it becomes fairly easy to occur as these strains are moving in hospitals, moving in communities, <laughs> moving among people in homes, so that the spread, in addition to the selection, makes for the resistance problem. I doubt many of you know how many antibiotics we produce in this country. But the latest statistics would say it's 35 million pounds. Now, a pound is 450 grams, and we hardly use even a gram to treat a patient. So you can see how much extra antibiotics are out there. A large amount of that, some say more than humans, is used in animals to help them grow better. 
a feature which has been removed from European health, but still here in this country, and we'll hear more about that from our third speaker. But also, in certain parts of the country, in Louisiana, in Washington, in Florida, they're being, plants are being sprayed, fruit trees are being sprayed with antibiotics, some that we use in people, to control a infection of the trees. Now, my friends in the plant pathology field want to replace this chemistry with biology, but for the moment, antibiotics are being sprayed. Think about you having a home downstream. You can't but be getting a little bit of selective antibiotic delivered to your household and there's nothing yet being done. 300,000 pounds of antibiotics are being used in this fashion. In the hospital, we usually give it parenterally, hence the uh, syringe, and in the home, the collection of antibiotics as tablets, as I mentioned, happened during what we often call cipromania. There's another scientific, almost fiction, story to antibiotic resistance, and that is that the resistance genes don't stay put in the organism they are once there. It's like a dog being able to transfer something to a cat or a pig to a cow. They're that different evolutionarily. That's why they're in two different colors. But these are not the same organism. And this will be the only sort of science I'll try to share with you. But think of it <laughs> as kind of something if we could have invented this you know, 60 years ago, before we discovered these features, they come, if this is the chromosome, the single feature of genetics for the organism, there are extra chromosomal units like this called a plasmid, which carries resistance genes on something called a transposon, which is a TN, all right? Now, these pieces of DNA can move from plasmids into, from strains that are different, and then they can jump onto the chromosome and become a part of that normal bacterial's genetic evidence. That's it. Now he's become, or she's become, or whatever, a resistant organism. They can come in on bacterial viruses, and even free DNA of an organism that's been killed can be scooped up by other bacteria and incorporated. So is there any reason why we should wonder why resistance has been created so quickly? Well, yeah, one thing, going back to the formula, all this is going on now. It's going on in your guts, on your skin. But it's not consequential unless you take an antibiotic that selects for that exchange which creates a resistant organism. And what's the result? These are all the living bacteria that have survived the treatment, transferring and sharing their transposons, their resistance genes. Anywhere in the globe, it'll move here. The MRSA event was so tragic and publicized that the, even the Boston Globe, one of our favorite newspapers, said, well, you've been, you know, engineered up and protected, and is there anything I should worry about? And he says, uh, you have a drug-resistant uh, infection. All right. As I said before, public awareness is important because of how we use antibiotics and how we store them and how we believe they are all powerful. But in fact, they have their both economic and environmental consequences. If we use antibiotics and human or plant agriculture animals, they just don't disappear after we use them. They gotta go somewhere. So we think flushing the toilet, that's it. It's gone, somebody's taking care of it. No, it goes to municipals wise. If they can limit the bacteria down to 1% of what was there in the beginning, they've accomplished something. And then it goes out into natural water. So is it any wonder that we're finding resistant bacteria and traces of antibiotics in certain areas of the country, nearby farms, for instance, or nearby sewage treatment plants? This is something we have to take care of because this environmental feature is an important one in how we are going to have to deal with the spread and the emergence of resistance. In fact, to me, as a clinician, I think most of resistance is occurring outside the body. When I see a patient come in, that's the patient brings in the resistant organism. Where did that patient get it? Maybe from a neighbor, maybe. From, but it's not something that I've created by giving the antibiotic in the person. We choose the antibiotic, we get rid of the organism. A lot of that is really coming in from outside. 
And I think when we begin to take a look at the ecology of resistance, we will find that a lot of resistance is out there in the natural environment. And we at the Alliance for Food and Use of Antibiotics are looking now worldwide at the kinds of resistances that exist in bacteria that are not causing infections. Because these are the reservoirs of antibiotic resistance that then get transferred by those mechanisms I discussed with you to bacteria that are of consequence of health. So we really have to look globally, not just country by country, but also homes, communities, and environments. There has been a movement, very distasteful for me, but anyway, a movement afoot in the US and now worldwide. And the general term would be germophobia, because people believe that, gee, if we can get rid of those bacteria, we will live safer and longer. So an interesting thing happened, and this is in, involves the marketing and the discovery. A company had a drug that was an antibacterial, but it wasn't something we could take for treatment. It was something as a cleaning agent. And it was put into plastic to keep the plastic to last longer on the shelf so it wouldn't do what we all want plastic to do, which is to be biodegraded. So a clever marketing person said, what are we now putting into our toothpaste and toothbrush handles? An antibacterial. Ah, next thing you know, there's the REACH toothbrush, an antibacterial toothbrush. But it wasn't in the bristles. It was in the handle. People didn't care. I get a phone call from somebody in, in Colorado. How they saw me, I don't know. He says, I'm sitting in my hot tub, and I see a little writing underneath the button you push to get the bubbles going, and it says, contains triclosan, an antibacterial. She says, what do I do? I said, well, what's the temperature of the tub? <laughs> it's pretty hot. I said, are you turning a little red? No. I said, well, then it's probably all right. But what I'm trying to tell you is it's in everything. And in fact, here's one ad. All right? Can you read it? Now you can be sure the only thing your kid's healing are it's just toys. All right? That was an antibacterial containing household cleaner. In um, Boston, you can buy, and it's the only place I understand, you can buy the famous New England mattress and box springs. And they are both totally impregnated with an antibacterial. Now, you can ask why. It's so that you sleep not only carefully, but safely against something else. I don't know what it could be, but we can think about it. The best thing, or one of the best, I thought, was in my own community, because Tufts is actually located in Chinatown. And one of my fellows came back with these packaged uh, sticks, which, uh, chopsticks, and I opened it up and I saw, my gosh, an antibacterial chopstick? <laughs> Whom, whose bacteria am I saving myself from? My own. That's pretty bad. But most recently, the latest has been Auric and the vacuum cleaner, and there's a competitor that does it a different way, which is you not only scoop up the dust and all, but there's built into the machine an antibacterial substance which is now going to kill whatever you suck up. All right? Come on already. Toyota makes a steering wheel with an antibacterial. So I'm not as worried, although we've shown now, that in fact these substances, and here are six of them, three of them leave residues, triclosan, uh, quaternary ammonia compounds, and triclocarbon, and three do not. The three that don't, I don't care, and they're great. Bleaches, peroxides, alcohols, they do their job quickly, they dissipate into the environment, they don't leave a residue. Bacteria can't really become resistant. But the others are chemicals. Now, if they're embedded in the plastic, they may leach out. But what bothers me most is the consumer wants it. The consumer believes that all this extra antibacterial is what they need for their home. A big mistake because it translates then into the misuse of antibiotics and misuse of other careful drugs that we need. In fact, we've shown in studies that in the laboratory 
that there is a pump for better news called, uh, it's an acridine pump, ACRAB. And look at what this pump, which is in the membrane of a bacterial cell, can do. It pumps out antibiotics, organic solvents, pine oils, and a whole slew of these antibacterials. So in fact, there's a joining together in one mechanism, co-resistance to antibiotics and to these drugs. So in fact, they can select bacteria resistant to themselves and to good antibiotics. The Alliance for Prudent Use of Antibiotics was established in 1981. It was really established to set an awareness worldwide. The problem wasn't much here. It was in the rest of the world. Its aims are multiple, and we'll go into this maybe in the questionnaire, but clearly we'd like to shorten the courses, we'd like to cycle usage. We really need to educate for prudent use of antibiotics, the consumer and the prescriber, and to invent new drugs, as was mentioned earlier those that resist the current resistances or they get around it. But we must remember that we are not the world, all right? We are part of the bacterial world, the microbial world. We're not going to destroy it. We're not going to sterilize it. And if we did, we would suffer. So in fact, the message I leave with everyone is, we really have to make peace with microbes. It, I abhor the idea that we're in war. Though it is not a war against the microbial world. We will win it, and we have enough wars on our hands. So let's make peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart, so much. I think that in a microbial world, you've got to wonder whether antibiotic tree chopsticks are culturally inappropriate. Um, but thank you for taking us through from cipromania to germophobia and also offering a number of really important, actually, policy steps that might be taken um, in the future. Um, clearly, the sprinkling of antibacterials from actually toothbrush handles to steering wheels leaves a lot of questions as to whether we're using effectively this very limited resource. And like some transposon, we'll now actually jump now to actually um, upstream to the supply side, the issue replenishing the supply of antibiotics. And um, to that issue, we are really delighted to have um, here with us Dr. Maria Ferreira, who is the, currently the new president of the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation, but is perhaps in her former incarnation as the chief executive officer of the Global Alliance for TB Drug Development, a position she's held since September 2001 that's most relevant to today's discussions. The TB Alliance actually is not a not-for-profit public-private partnership that was created to develop new, faster-acting anti-TB medicines that are affordable and accessible to patients worldwide. Um, she's been a wonderful colleague to us, particularly um, from the days when I was at Rockefeller and since. Prior to that, she was also the director of the Office of Technology Transfer at the US NIH from 1995 to 2001, where she was involved in the central development and implementation of technology transfer practices and procedures for the Department of Health and Human Services. This is perhaps an incredibly important area that's actually not well studied oftentimes, that actually now in many ways is of a crucial part of actually how we actually move important technologies to the developing world, and no doubt important for her role when she was at the Global, actually rather at the uh, Global Alliance for TB Drug Development. She was involved in patent licensing activities for the NIH and FDA, and while in government service, she was um, decorated with the, the DHH Secretary's Award for Distinguished Service, the Arthur S. Fleming Award, and also the 2002 Bayh Dole Award. She's a biophysicist by training, as well as her postgraduate work actually in immunology and virology, and she's been the recipient of Fulbright Fellowship as well as two U.S. Congressional Science Fellowships. It's my delight to have Maria Freire to come join us here to discuss actually the supply side of antibacterials. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here, great to see some familiar faces, and hopefully I'll leave with some new friends today. This is, um, I, I'm one month into my new tenure at the uh, Lasker Foundation, 
And uh, I've been known to slip and say we when I talk about the alliance. I have to remember to say they. But it was six and a half years that were really outstanding and fantastic. And it started with a, <clears throat> with a rather bold idea. And uh, I'm going to go through that. But what I'd like to do today is divide my talk into three parts, basically. First, a little bit of background on the numbers and what we're talking about in tuberculosis. Second, what we did about it. What is the, the experiment that we started and embarked on? And third, what the consequence of that is from a, a global perspective. So we've spoken this morning already about a very large issue of resistance, and I'm going to now narrow it down to a case study, and the case study will be um, tuberculosis. So let's talk about the numbers. How many people in this room know about tuberculosis and the, its impact in the world? The fact that it kills one person every 20 seconds, for example. Raise your hands. And of you, how many have seen people take their TB treatment? Okay, so we're going to go through that. And I have people that can bail me out when I talk about what I'm about to say. So let's look at the numbers. A third of the world infected with the latent uh, form of tuberculosis. It is the biggest killer of women of childbearing age in the world. It kills about 1.6 million people every year. And about 8 to 9 million get infected all over again. The economic bill for the tuberculosis uh, epidemic is $16 billion. The interesting thing is that the antibiotics work. They are relatively inexpensive. The cost of the treatment is primarily in the way we have to deliver it in order precisely to avoid drug resistance. However, we've been relatively unsuccessful. Let me go back here. <clears throat> the way we treat tuberculosis is we do it through what is called the directly observed treatment. That's the WHO, World Health Organization, recommendation. So what you do is you're, you are asked to take your antibiotics, and the treatment takes six to nine months, and this is how you do it. You take um, a combination of four drugs for the first two months, and then for the following four months, you have to take intermittent treatment for tuberculosis. Now, I come from Peru, and um, one of the first things I did when I became CEO of the Alliance is I went to Peru, which is an endemic country for tuberculosis, and I watched people take their treatment. It's a combination of 11 pills that you have to take in one sitting to take those four antibiotics. So the women leave their home, they go to whoever the, the, the closest medical facility um, to them, and then they go back. It is an unnatural thing to do, to leave, take your antibiotics, and come back. In this country, in New Jersey, for example, you have a wonderful facility in Newark in which you actually have Rebecca. And Rebecca takes her minivan, and she will take the pills with her, and she will go, and I have gone with Rebecca to do a directly observed treatment, and Rebecca will go up the stairs and watch people take their medicine for six months. That's the cost of tuberculosis. So it's a social cost, it's an economic cost, and importantly, people stop taking the, the antibiotics. As Lee Reichman <clears throat> likes to say, this is an entirely man-made epidemic. Multi-drug resistance to tuberculosis is entirely man-made. Now we have, as Stuart mentioned earlier, the extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis or extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. And what, how did we figure it out? Well. In KwaZulu-Natal, about two years ago, we discovered that there were people that were infected with tuberculosis that within two weeks of diagnosis died. We didn't understand what was happening there. So it was a combination of a TB and HIV co-infection, and it was, was essentially a new strain of tuberculosis that was resistant to essentially everything that, that we had and we knew. We were running out of weapons. XDR-TB has pretty much been identified all over the world. And as um, Anthony mentioned earlier, Andrew Speaker, as you recall, was also one of the people who we thought might have the extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. The point I'm making is that we're talking about a big epidemic. We're talking about big numbers. And we're talking about a, a set of problems which are, um, in which we have no more weapons. 
the world is running out of weapons. The good news is that <clears throat> in the year 2000, a group of very clever people, about 60 people, got together in Cape Town, South Africa, and said, we have to do something about this. Now, this was the year 2000. XDR was uh, dis first described in 2005 or 2006. So we were a little ahead of the game. So what they created is a new organization, which they said, let's create a non-for-profit pharmaceutical. Let's figure out how to work on, on making new antibiotics for tuberculosis, for which there is no market. The, the pharmaceutical companies Anthony already mentioned need a return for the investment. The return for the investment wasn't there. So what I'd like to talk to you today about for the next few minutes is what was created and, and how we went about doing it. So the Global Alliance for TB Drug Development is what we called a product development partnership. You've, you've heard about public-private partnerships. And they, their um, last count, there were about 89 of them in health alone. But we are a subset. The, we see, listen to me, I have to stop doing that. The, um, the product development partnerships are a subset of the public-private partnerships because part of the mission is to actually have a product. So we have to develop TB drug candidates and novel regimens for treatment. Remember, tuberculosis will be treated in combination to avoid resistance. We have to continue to foster discovery, but we, our job was also to bring other people into the discovery and development of, of TB antibiotics. People had left the field. We had to figure out a way of attracting them. And in doing so, we had to make sure that the product of our efforts was going to be affordable, was going to be accessible to the people who needed it, and was going to be adopted in the field. And why are these criteria important? And I will discuss this here, um, because I, I'm not going to touch it in, in uh, the next few slides. Because, first of all, if you have something that you can't afford, the people who need it are not going to be able to, to take it. Tuberculosis is a disease of poverty. It's not a tropical disease. It's a disease of poverty. As I mentioned before, it exists in New Jersey. And so we have to ensure that in the economies where there is no coverage for this, that people can, can take them. Adoption. Why is adoption important? We heard Stuart talk about antibiotics that were given IV. Well, you can't take that to the field. We can't go to sub-Saharan Africa with that kind of a, an antibiotic. So we have to figure out the mechanism and the drug that will actually do the work, and it has to have those three important components. That's our vision. Um, I made this slide, as you can probably tell, and I can also tell you that I counted the number of doses. These are the mountains of pills that we're asking people to take. So our vision is at the end of this exercise to have perhaps, um, this is a little bit uh, uh, Pollyannish on, on our part, I suppose, but wouldn't it be nice to have a blister pack in which you would actually have fixed dose combinations of antibiotic that you can give people and they would be able to take it. Again, through a system that reduces the kind of resistance. We don't want these things flying all over creation. But that's the, that was the vision of the organization. What are we looking for? We're looking for a treatment that is two months or less that can be effective about, against multidrug resistance and uh, extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis that can be co-administered with antiretroviral drugs because, remember, we have these populations that are co-infected. We want to shorten and improve the treatment of latent tuberculosis, and it has to be, as I said, adopted in the field. I can tell you today that we will achieve the two-month treatment. I am very confident that we can do that. But I can t also tell you today that we will take a long time to figure out how to tackle the latent tuberculosis. The science is simply not there. So. How do we go about figuring out where to get these antibiotics? You, Anthony already told you that the pharmaceutical companies, they, the premise of the alliance was interesting. They, the idea was that <clears throat> we would be able to go into all these pharmaceutical companies that had all these antibiotics sitting on the shelf, just pluck them, use the resources that we would get from governments and we got from the Rockefeller Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and then move them outsource the development, manage the, the project, and move them out. Well, what happened was they weren't there. We just couldn't find them. So we made it our business to scout the world. We went to China. 
we went to Korea, we went to Switzerland, we went to India, we went to New Zealand. We scouted the world for every possible antibiotic that we could bring into our, our pipeline. We went through scientific and technical reviews, due diligence and negotiations with the owners of the intellectual property until we finally made the deal. So these are some sample deals. Anthony told you that in my previous life, I was a deal maker. This is what I did at the National Institutes of Health. We had to transfer the technology from the scientists at NIH and move them for the public benefit. So anybody in this room who knows a little bit about intellectual property can, can um, identify the fact that we were very nimble. This organization allowed us to be very nimble in the way we negotiated with pharmaceutical companies, with governments, and with different research groups. And this is what we have today. This is the current uh, portfolio of the TB Alliance. And as you can see, we have two drugs that are currently into the um, clinical trials site, and we have a whole host of other compounds that are coming through the pipeline. You will also notice that I have identified who we partner with. We have no laboratory, so we have to be clever in, in leveraging our knowledge of tuberculosis, our ability of project management, our funding, and move the technology forward. The second line, PA24, is a drug I licensed from a company called Chiron that was later taken over by Novartis. Chiron made a strategic decision. They knew they had this antibiotic, but they knew they weren't going to put any money behind it. So we came in and we said, we'll take it. And I got to tell you, it was one of the toughest negotiations to go to a company and say, I want to take your antibiotic. And the company said, but you're three people. I mean, how can you possibly get this to move? And I said, well, trust us. And I don't know about you, but my mother always said never to um, accept that as an explanation. So. Yeah. We, um, we did. We brought it in, and we created an interesting agreement with the company. We said, we're going to put enough money behind this and enough intelligence behind this and enough manpower behind this to move the compound forward. And if we don't, we'll give you the money. And the company said, that's interesting. Okay, so if they were concerned that we were going to bring their baby, their antibiotic, let it sit on the shelf and not move it. And I said, okay. I'll bring it in, and I can assure you, if I don't put the resources behind it, you're going to get it anyway. Well, we beat every single deadline and milestone that a pharmaceutical company beat. Within three years, we had that, um, we had that compound starting clinical trials, and we're very proud of that. It's still it's in what we called uh, um, EBA uh, phase right now, and uh, we're, which is the very first new, completely new antibiotic um, <clears throat> that has gone into humans in uh, an FAS2 trial. So we're, I'm, I'm very proud of that particular accomplishment. But I'm also proud of the fact that in doing this, in using our resources, we created an infrastructure for others to go into um, tuberculosis. And, um, well, let me skip that for a minute and go here. So... Um, as, as the CEO of the TB Alliance, I was also the chair of the WHO Stop TB movement. And as chair of that organization, I tried to bring together, we tried to bring together the different players and partners. And during the past six years, it's been very interesting, pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies have gone into the field of tuberculosis. And so this is what we now have. This is the current global pipeline. The majority, uh, the, the TB Alliance has the biggest uh, single pipeline, but this is an interesting slide because what you will see is, I don't know if you can see the two colors. Yes, I can't see them here. But um, the, the existing classes of antibiotics, some of them are moving forward, but the totally novel classes, look at the discovery um, space. There's a lot of new novel potential uh, discovery projects that are working in this. Where we have a dip is in the preclinical. We have a problem when you have a drug pipeline, you go from very early discovery all the way to clinical trials and registration. In the world of tuberculosis, we have a problem with the preclinical part because there has been very little activity, and that's a reflection of the, the lack of activity that we've had there. I put that slide, this slide in here to remind myself 
to talk to you about the combination of therapies. So the alliance looks for, this is, this is how we look at the, uh, how, how the TB alliance looks at the TB bacillus. We look at it by function, and our investment is by function. You will see that we don't think that antibiotics that attack cell wall, for example, is, is the best way or the best place to invest. But we feel very comfortable um, putting a lot of resources into the energy production or the transcription and translation because we think that that's possibly where we're going to attack. But the key is to have antibiotics that will attack the bacillus from different angles. So maybe we want to put in a combination something that attacks the respiratory chain, something that attacks the transcription chain, something that attacks the translation chain. So not only are we creating new antibiotics, but the new combinations are going to be powerful because they're going to be intelligently designed to tackle different targets within the bacillus. So I want to um, end by telling you what... Um, now we're part of this global plan to stop TB. So where, where do I think the, the gaps and where do I think the opportunities are? I think the lessons that I have learned over the past six and a half years is that we really do in, need innovation in this space. There has been a dearth of innovation in, in the research, in particular when it comes to latency and what is known as persistence for tuberculosis. That is something that we really do need to, to move forward on. In terms of collaboration, we will need all the resources. We have to act and think comprehensively because it may be a pharmaceutical company that has the best drug for transcription. And so they can't go it alone, but nobody else can either. So we do need to think about this in a, in a cohesive and holistic way. And finally, of course, resource mobilization. Uh, we do need people in this field the, the students in the room, this is a really neat, exciting place to be. It's, it's, um, it's tackling disease from a different way. It's tackling it at a great, grand scale, and it's creating a novel mechanism to do that. Um, there are going to be problems with finances. This takes money. Even in a non-for-profit, we estimate that a new development for TB drugs is going to cost $100 million. maybe not $800 million or $1.5 billion as the companies would like to do. The, they do the math a little differently than we do, but, uh, uh, but, but without a doubt, it takes money. And of course, we need the technical competence. So what are the results? And I say this with a great sense of pride, and the credit goes to a remarkable group of dedicated people, both in the TB Alliance and the partners worldwide. We have a new par paradigm for drug development, we believe we have a new way of, uh, we've talked to regulatory agencies about a revolutionary way of putting more than one antibiotic together and taking it through the re regulatory uh, pathway. We have met and surpassed the timelines for industry, and we're very proud of that. We brought the other players that I mentioned earlier, and again, this has become now a, an interesting and important movement. And we understand the TV distribution channels and markets. I haven't spent a lot of time on that, but that was a really neat project. I can tell you right now how the people in India, how the people in South Africa, how the people in Brazil, how the people in Tanzania, how the people in Peru get their tuberculosis drugs. And I can tell you what the worldwide market is. It's about $350 million, and that's not very large. So we, we, um, we have created new impetus, new, new energy behind the tuberculosis uh, need and experiment. And there's still a long ways to go, but it's uh, at least one way of developing drugs, of tackling drug resistance that wasn't there five years ago. So this is a good, this is a good thing to do. Thanks. Thank you, Maria, for leading us through actually the lens of TB, a disease so entwined actually with the other major epidemic of our time, HIV AIDS, through the complexity of developing new drugs to fill a public health need, a need otherwise not really, would not, that otherwise would not be uh, met actually by the private sector alone, and how a product development partnership actually can, often, can move from the science to the deal making. And I think if that's actually not the definition of a global challenge, I don't know what is. Um, we're now going to move actually from re-engineering the value chain on the supply side to re-engineering it on the demand side. And our third panelist is David Walinga, 
the physician director of the Food and Health Program at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, a Minneapolis-based NGO. Very much in keeping with the Grand Challenges multidisciplinary approach, David applies a, a systems perspective to the intersection of public health, agriculture, food, and the environment. <laughs> I've had the good fortune of knowing him for actually quite a number of years. Um, there aren't too many of us actually who are actually from the move who are actually um, physicians. Um, but for several years, well, um, David has researched and advocated around early life exposures to neurotoxins on the developing brains of children authoring um, such great mealtime reading as Playing Chicken, Avoiding Arsenic in Your Meat, Poultry on Antibiotics, Hazards to Human Health, <laughs> and also co-developed the Pediatric Environmental Health Toolkit. His expertise includes the impacts of food contamination and the means of food production on human health, including obesity, and most germane to today's panel, the ecological health impacts on inappropriate use of antibiotics in livestock and poultry. He, in that role, he has played a, a very in, in, influential part, actually, in the Keep Antibiotics Working Coalition, that has really sought to change how multinational food companies source their products, that is, without the inappropriate use of antibiotics upstream in the supply chain. He's also served on the board of scientific counselors to the CDC's National Center for Environmental Health and previously on the science advisory board of the EPA. He received his medical degree from the University of Minnesota Medical School, his bachelor's from Dartmouth, and of course he's one of our own, an MPA 1994 graduate from the Woodrow Wilson School. Welcome, David, to the podium. Well, thank you, Anthony. Uh, our first speaker um, taught us that antibiotic resistance is not just a grand challenge, but it's a, an ecological challenge as well. And that has to do with the fact that, in part, that bacteria are promiscuous, that they like to glom onto these uh, pieces of DNA that may help make them resistant to uh, antimicrobials. And they'll freely swap them, even with bacteria that look nothing like them or come from a different species. Um, they're also, it's also an ecological problem because these bacteria, the antibiotics themselves, even the genes are dispersed throughout our environment, whether it's the hospital environment, household environment, uh, our water environment, and our farm environments. And this, this creates another one of those tensions that Dr. So is talking about, uh, policy tensions. In this case, it's the tragedy of the commons. We have a common good to keep our stock of antibiotics effective for treating human illness. But unfortunately, any one of us or any, any single economic use of antibiotics is going to serve to undermine that long-term effectiveness. And so literally, uh, one antibiotic use um, anywhere can potentially affect <laughs> the effectiveness of, of, of another antibiotic use somewhere down the line. And so uh, while it's important to work on the supply side of the equation, coming up with a new pipeline of effective drugs, um, really I'm going to focus on the demand side because I think until we reduce antibiotic overuse, we're not going to address this essential ecological nature of the problem. And this isn't, you know, it's easy to follow Dr. Levy because he's been talking about this literally for a quarter of a century. And uh, as he said in 1976, all areas of antibiotic use merit uh, critical evaluation. And the Institute of Medicine uh, 25 years later said the same thing basically, but that we need to focus on antibiotic use in agriculture as a critical component of that overall use. And so maybe it's not so surprising that I stand here as a physician who works at a sustainable agriculture think tank uh, to talk to you about reducing the demand side, uh, uh, that is, reducing the use of antibiotics in agriculture. Well, why, why agriculture? Why is this important to focus on? Well, um, one of the reasons is that there's actually quite a good consensus in the science now that the antibiotic use, the antimicrobial use in food animals is contributing in a significant way to this overall problem uh, in creating resistant organisms that are transmitted to people. And I'm not going to go through all the studies, but I do want to give you a flavor for how that happens. 
Probably the most important way is that when the antibiotics are used in the farm, it creates, helps to create these resistant uh, bugs, and including even these posturer bugs like MRSA, that can end up in the food chain. And inadvertently, and especially if we're not preparing the food correctly, it contaminates the meat that we buy in the supermarket. But there are other ecological ways, <laughs> other less direct ways, too. So Dr. Levy, for example, again, a quarter century ago, was starting to document how the farmers and the other farm workers can directly be colonized with resistant bacteria as a result of their use of antibiotics in the farm environment. And we know, too, that up to 75% of the antibiotics given to an animal will end up in the manure. So where does the manure go? Well, a lot of it ends up getting reapplied to the land that grows the food. And then through that ends up in the waterways adjacent to the land, some of which are upstream from, our, uh, from the water intakes for our municipal water systems. So it really is an environmental issue, and we, we need to think about it in that way. Now, by the way, in terms of MRSA, just an interesting note, some of the most recent and, and frankly concerning information is that uh, coming out of researchers in Ontario at the University of Guelph, and uh, they tested several hundred packages of retail pork, and in fact, they're finding a strain of MRSA, not the same strain that typically affects the human population right now, but a strain of MRSA on about one in 10 packages of retail pork. Another reason to focus on agricultural use is that the volume of use is huge. Now, we don't have great numbers on this because as a society, we have not decided to track antibiotic usage, regardless of whether it's in hospitals or in, in, in uh, the farm environment or in soaps. But uh, if you look at the Institute of Medicine, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, even the, even the um, animal drug industry a trade group, uh, Animal Health Institute, they all basically agree that the volume of use of antibiotics in animals is somewhere in the order of 20 to 30 million pounds a year. So it's really enormous. And how are they used? Well, of course, when animals get sick, we want to be able to treat them with effective antibiotics too, right? And, and nobody disputes that use. But the information that we have suggests that by far the majority of the use is instead for animals that aren't clinically sick. It's for animals that are being raised in very crowded, often indoor facilities that makes them prone to disease. It's being used as a growth promoter. Uh, in other words, to bring the animal to market weight faster using less feed. And the way that these antibiotics are used is concerning from a resistance standpoint because they're being used in feed or in drinking water to dose groups of animals, not individual animals. Uh, and it's a routine use, and it's at concentrations in the feed that are lower than that which we would expect to kill the bacteria. And so the, the unit of concerned scientists estimates, for example, in comparison to human use, that about 25 million pounds a year of antimicrobials are going into feed just for chicken, for beef cattle, and for swine. And this compares to about 3 million pounds of use in treating humans, and about 2 million pounds yearly in treating sick animals. And this is a picture of a bag of antibiotics in my neck of the woods in the Midwest. You can go into a feed store and, without any prescription, buy a 50-pound bag of tetracycline buy a 50-pound bag of penicillin, and then you then put it in the animal feed. So uh, just um, to restate that statistic, about 70% using the best available data, about 70% of all the antimicrobials or antibiotics used in the US we think are being given just to these beef cattle, poultry, and swine in their feed. Now, um, these are not <coughs> antibiotics that you're unfamiliar with. Uh, in fact, about half of them belong to classes like the penicillins, the tetracyclines, the macrolid or erythromycin-like antibiotics, uh, sulfa drugs. Um, they're familiar names, and they have important human uses as well. Now, one of the, one of the policy issues is that um, the majority of these were approved by the FDA for use in animal feed decades ago. They've been on the market for a long time. 
And our knowledge of the nature of antibiotic resistance was such that when they were first approved, this potential for increasing resistance was never taken into account. So we've got the fact that they're being widely used in animal feed, but they've never really been evaluated for safety from that standpoint. Other concerns with how these antibiotics are used, uh, I mentioned that they're not by prescription. There's no veterinary oversight. You can just go into a store and buy them, and that's, in fact, how it's usually done. There's poor dose control. If you're putting antibiotics in the feed or in the drinking water for the animal, you don't actually know how much any individual animal gets. And so it raises the concern that some animals are going to get a much uh, lower exposure, too low to kill the bacteria, but maybe enough to select for the most resistant bacteria in the animal. Poor infection control. Um, that picture in the upper right, we wouldn't dream of having a nursery ward where we pack little babies in, because we know that's a setup for the passing of infectious <coughs> disease. And yet, this is exactly how we raise the vast majority of our meat for human consumption. Indoors, very crowded. Uh, pigs and chickens in particular. Cattle are also confined, but in outdoor environments. There's no infection control there. In Europe, when they raise flocks of chicken in Denmark, for example, they clean out the barn after every flock about six weeks. In the US, uh, uh, the average is about every one to two years. As best as we can tell, some of these practices are hard to really get information about. And then finally, there's no ecologic controls. As I said, the antibiotics are in the manure, and there's virtually no regulation of where the manure goes. And so a lot of it is stored in manure lagoons and then sprayed in the land. It gets aerosolized and can be carried uh, hundreds of yards, if not miles, in the air currents. Now, is this really necessary? Well, in fact, it's not. Uh, in the US, certified organic production specifically prohibits antibiotic use. If an animal gets sick, which is much more rare in an organic environment, they get diverted into a different stream and they're not sold as organic. They don't use any antibiotic uh, feed additives in organic production. But in Europe, even conventional production has phased out now the use of antibiotics routinely in animal feed. And the best case study is in Denmark, the largest pork exporter in the world. And in 1998 and 1999, they phased out this growth promotion use of antibiotics in feed completely. And what happened? Well, for one thing, they reduced their total antibiotic use by over half. Well, some might say, didn't the animals suffer? Wasn't the food more expensive? So the World Health Organization and Danish scientists went in and looked at those questions. And in fact, what they found is that they reduced the human use, the human risks from this practice, without any impact on food safety, without any impact on consumer prices, and virtually no impact on producers. The animal health was, was basically the same. And so why not? Well, again, in the, with the tragedy of the commons, there is some benefit to the people who are overusing or the entities that are overusing the antibiotics. And in this case, there's an economic benefit, of course, to the companies that are selling them but also to the uh, large-scale industrial animal producers, the largest companies in the world. These are global companies. And they are using the antibiotics, uh, or have in the past, because this was an inter integral part of the production system, that when you raise animals on corn rather than on grass, when you raise animals in a confined environment, and when you raise a uh, 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 and when, when you raise animals with routine antibiotics, that this is part of the production system. And so what they found in Denmark is that they had to change the way they did things. They cleaned out the barns more often. They gave the animals more space. They're still raising them indoors uh, in a confined system, but they really have changed the practices to improve hygiene, to improve infection control. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of resistance to that in the US. So what are the policy uh, levers for decreasing demand for antibiotics in agriculture. Well, of course, there's direct education. And as Anthony mentioned, uh, I'm very involved in a seven-year-old coalition of groups representing 9 million Americans uh, called the Keep Antibiotics Working Coalition. 
Um, and one of the things we do is to try to educate people about the extent of this agricultural problem. We've really focused on agricultural use. There are others doing the hospital overuse, and, and et cetera. <coughs> one of the things we've looked at is what is, the, what is the possibility for stricter regulation of antibiotics? Another thing we focused on is changing the market. There's been some, uh, there's been some um, real progress in changing the market. We've worked with large institutional purchasers like Bon Appetit, which does a lot of the food service management for college campuses. I don't know if they're at Princeton or not, but many of the colleges near my house, they provide the food service. Since 19, 2003, they've actually had a policy on antibiotic use in food animals. Um, we work with hospitals uh, to put in place policies in their contracting for food service so that they preferentially choose companies and vendors supplying meat raised without antibiotics. Even companies like Tyson, uh, several years ago McDonald's decided they wanted to decrease the amount of antibiotics used in their chicken production. Tyson is uh, their largest, if not their exclusive, chicken supplier. They told Tyson, we want you to do this. Tyson did it. They reduced their antibiotic use, according to Tyson, by 93%. Now the, the problem with this, though, is that um, it's very difficult to verify. There is no public mechanism for verifying these claims. And also Tyson, which was among the companies uh, that were the largest producers using antibiotics 10 years ago, uh, are now um, in a position to be able to transition the way they do things. The smaller producers can much less afford to uh, change the way that they are raising animals. And so we think that really federal legislation is a way to address some of these concerns, the, the, um, the lack of a level playing field, for example, and also the inability to verify. And so one of the things we're doing is um, supporting uh, PAMTA, the Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment pa uh, Act. It's got bipartisan support. Uh, it's also endorsed by many medical and public health groups, as you'll see here. This would do a number of things. It would, for the first time, track antibiotic usage and make that data publicly available, the same data that now industry can get by buying it. It would kind of switch the burden so that any existing approvals for antibiotic feed additives would be sunsetted or phased out over two years for these medically important drugs unless FDA were able to find that there's no harm to people coming from their continued use. And then thirdly, uh, it has a title that would help transition farmers to this new way of doing things. I want to just end by speaking briefly. Uh, some slides got deleted somehow, but. Why not just have the FDA, which regulates these animal approvals, do a better job of regulating? And the issue there is that, in fact, the FDA's authority under statute is incredibly weak. They have a very high hurdle to withdraw the approval for an existing antibiotic feed additive. They've basically got to show an imminent hazard to public health. And given the complexity of the problem, with this ecological nature of resistance, the traveling of resistance genes across bacteria, even from bacteria that are thought to be uh, not dangerous to ones that are, um, that that burden, that, that burden of proof is very hard for FDA to meet. And then in fact, they've got budget pressures and some other things too. Um, Dr. Levy mentioned cipromania. Well, in 2000, Actually, in, in, uh, starting in the late 1990s, FDA approved a Cipro analog called uh, um, Batril, or fluoroquinolone analog called Batril for use in poultry flocks. It wasn't a feed additive. It was, it was put in drinking water for sick birds. But very shortly, that animal use created Cipro-resistant bacteria that were infecting people. And the FDA was so concerned um, about this problem that they uh, proposed taking that drug off the market in 2000. But in fact, the process for getting that withdrawal to happen is very protracted. It took six years. So that FDA's authority is weak enough and its budget constraints are severe enough that it's actually 
hard for them to act in an expeditious way to protect public health. And so that's, again, why uh, in terms of our focus with Keep Antibiotics Working, we're really looking at federal legislation as a way to reduce antibiotic use in agriculture and hopefully keep penicillins and tetracyclines and other human drugs more effective for years to come. Thank you. That sobering example, of course, reminds us how much further we have to go in this area. It's wonderful, though, to see the very concrete actions being taken by the Keep Antibiotics Working Coalition on this and uh, David's important contribution to those efforts. From manure lagoons to organic production and the promise of improved policy approaches, this was the ideal pre-lunch talk, but we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, and I'm sure that there are some in the audience. And I think there are microphones that will be actually that you can speak into for the questions. Do you want to just... Uh... I think we have one here. Uh, Stuart, uh, as a retired vice president of Johnson & Johnson, I got a chuckle over your comments on Reach Toothbrush, which I worked on. Uh, <laughs> and just quickly, nice the rationale for yeah. adding triclosan was that in many, many families, there's multiple use of the toothbrushes by children. So in order to prevent some of those trans infections, Could we have a louder, please? triclosan to the handle. <laughs> uh, now, relative to that, however, uh, the, the panel members interchangeably use the words of antimicrobial and antibiotic. Not all antimicrobials are antibiotic. Can you comment on the a drug resistance that may develop to chemicals such as triclosan or peroxides versus antibiotics, which generally are biologically sourced material? Are they uh, are, are the chemical antimicrobials just as bad in developing drug resistance? And multiple drug resistance as the antibiotics per se. Unfortunately, they are. And in fact, uh, that interesting paper in Science from uh, Jerry Wright's group in Canada showed that if you took Streptomyces, which is a soil organism, and looked for its ability to resist the synthetic antimicrobials, because antimicrobials we use for a broader term, meaning every microbe, whereas antibiotics are generally guarded for the uh, bacteria. The trimethoprins, the sulfonides, yeah. the cipros, the fluorophyll, they were all subject to uh, resistance. So there is no real difference in terms of the ability of one antibiotic or an antimicrobial as a group uh, versus an antibiotic to select for resistance or cross-resistance. Great. Can we have another question on this end? And I think there's probably a couple of questioners on the middle that we can pass the microphone for the next queue. Uh, Why? Well, I'm an urban planner, so I, I don't know much about this, but just something occurred to me. You know, these antibiotics are basically selecting for the resistant bacteria. And if you had an antibiotic which had developed a number of resistant bacteria and you retired that antibiotic for a number of years, forgetting how you would do it. So generations, many, many, many generations of bacteria no longer were being selected for resistance to that. Would you rejuvenate that bacteria, that antibiotic after, you know, two, five, 10, 20 years um, of non-use of it? Let's do this part another year. Um, yeah. Um, yes, you would, but it would take that long. And the other is that if you created a new combination of antibiotics in an organism, uh, you would, that combination would be very hard to remove genetically and reverse because there's no reversing selection. What you would end up with, re, just as you said, substituting the resistant ones with the susceptible ones. Anyone who thinks the resistant ones lose their resistance is, is incorrect. Oh, but you're no longer selecting it for it, so it right. no longer that is That is one tactic that is considered, certainly in, in a particular environment, and one would hope that then, then you return the use, that you would use it in a more so rational way. So the way farmers will rotate a field, would it make sense, assuming you could control the policy, to take certain antibiotics, you know, put them on, I don't know, 20-year cycles? <laughs> well, the reversibility, it turns out that it's quite difficult to fully reverse. So when in Europe they started ramping back on some of the growth promoters, they found examples where the resistance persisted, and they're puzzled why that was. And it turns out it, 
it, it comes back to the fact that this resistance can be physically linked to different elements, whether it's antibiotics or heavy metals. So in fact, in Europe, a lot of the farmers were trying to adjust by increasing copper use in feed. And the, the resistance to copper was selecting, continuing to select for the resistance to the antibiotics as well. So in fact, uh, I think theoretically you would have to reduce the use of all the antibiotics and other elements that are physically linked in those resistance uh, genes. And so that might be a dozen different antibiotics. Another question back here? There's some more people actually in the middle. Hi. We can pass um, I'm a physician here at Princeton, and I have, I have two questions, one for Dr. Levy and doc, one for Dr. Freire. Dr. Levy, right now, the standard of care for skin infections um, for strep throat is penicillin, you know, strep throat penicillin for 10 days, uh, cellulitis, cep cephalexin, or dicloxacillin for 10 days. Is there any research out there now that says that we can get away with seven days, five days, so if I can, that's the question for you. And then Dr. Freer, um, I'm really interested. We have a lot of students, probably between 100 and 200 students that come here every year with positive TB tests, PPDs, negative chest x-rays, no disease. disease. And um, the question is what to treat them with. We're doing INH for nine months right now. That's the standard of care through the CDC. But the question is whether rifampin is acceptable and is there anything else that is being studied? So those are my two questions. Thank you. To answer the first question, there are studies being sponsored through the NIH to see if you can shorten drug, uh, <clears throat> drug dosing time-wise uh, or substitute with another. There may be a good reason to use a penicillin derivative for five days rather than penicillin for 10. <laughs> so yes, it's certainly, but, but looking at all generic drugs, not the uh, newer drugs, to see if one can use an inexpensive generic drug for less period of time for something like strep throat or other diseases. Yes. Okay, Maria. And the answer to the, the INH is, the, uh, the latency is, is the INH treatment. Now, the, let me tell you what is being done for that. It, um, it was identified as one of the grand challenges of global health for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So there is concerted research specifically in the latency area um, being done currently. Um, uh, uh, Douglas Young is the researcher in the UK that's working on that. So I can talk to you a little bit more about that. I think we have someone right here. Uh, the, my question is for Dr. Walenga. You spoke of animal treatments. You didn't speak of fish farming, and my concern not only for the fish farming use of antibacterial uh, elements, but also its spread to the seas. Right. There, there, I mean, that is definitely a, uh, an interest. In particular, um, people may recall that the use of chloramphenicol in shrimp farms various places throughout the world has been uh, a great concern. The volume of use, the reason I didn't mention it is, is that keep antibiotics working doesn't focus on aquaculture, but also the volume of use is probably much, much lower um, than, than is used in these livestock and poultry uh, operations. But again, we don't really know because we're not tracking antibiotic use uh, in the US or, uh, or abroad, so it's difficult to know for sure. I can add a bit of optimism, and that is, uh, when I first wrote my book in 92, uh, there was no control over the use of uh, antimicrobials in the fish industry. And uh, 10 years later, with a re-edition and went back to uh, our agency, there is. And there's a tremendous decrease in the use in aquaculture. So although the amounts are small, the delivery can be large. So your point is well taken. But we are making progress. I think that's one area we can be uh, reasonably proud of. Do we have time for a final question? Um, I actually have a couple question. There was a graphic that was presented earlier on. I think you had it up, Anthony, uh, which showed sort of a dispersion map of various problems. There were the orange arrows. And I just want to make sure I interpreted it correctly. It seemed like one of the arrows was passing 
into the United States. Another one was passing over Canada to Alaska. Am I to interpret that as Canada, the situation between Canada and U.S. is different in terms of the problems that Canada has? No, I think actually it was simply it was just showing the distribution actually where struck the ground. Right through Canada. 23 out of Cologne is gone. I'm sure you're not immune if the Alaskans get it. <laughs> And with that, uh, I think that's probably all we have, I imagine, time for um, today. Each of us on the panel, whether it's through the global networks such as React and the Alliance for Prudent Use of Antibiotics, a, a product development partnership like such as the Global Alliance for Tuberculosis Drug Development or the Keep Antibiotics Working Coalition, have sought to tackle a too often neglected global challenge, that of actually antibiotic resistance. And clearly, this is a challenge that requires multidisciplinary approaches, a future prophetically told foretold really by Alexander Fleming at the dawn of the antibiotic age, and one that we hope that some of you will take on. Please join me in thanking our panelists, Stuart Levy, Maria Ferrer, and David Olenka, for sharing the perspective yesterday.